Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, and John and Becky Johnston. Coming up on DTNS, Joel Telling is here to help you understand how to get into 3D printing. Plus, Amazon buys a primary healthcare provider and a spam fighting service that charges the spammer, not you. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, July 21st, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, host of 3D Printing Nerd, Joel Telling. Welcome. Well, oh, thank you so much. Hey, <laughs> hey it's Joel. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you guys having me. Oh, thanks. Thanks for being here. I can't wait to talk uh, 3D printing and more, but let's start with a few tech things you should know. Facebook announced two new feeds on its mobile apps for iOS and Android. The home feed will be displayed when first opening the app. That uses an algorithm-based method for personalized discovery of Facebook content. A new feeds tab will contain recent posts from your friends, your groups, your pages, and your favorites. Feeds will not offer suggested posts, so those are in that new home feed. Now, if you don't see that yet, the update will roll out globally over the next week. I mean, it's kind of genius, separating what you want from the things they want you to want. Uh, 12 months after Framework debuted its modular laptop, it's sending out its first round of update kits. You know, the things that make having a modular laptop worth having. New modules. And Gadget describes pulling out the mainboard CPU and I.O. while keeping existing RAM, solid-state drive, Wi-Fi card, battery, audio gear, screen, all pretty much everything else uh, the same. You just swap out the CPU. And Gadget said all you needed was the included Torx T5 screwdriver and then to follow some color-coded uh, and labeled parts. There's some QR codes with links to the videos if you need them. And Gadget felt like it wasn't entirely newbie proof, but it was still easier than what you would have to do on another laptop. New main boards range from $499 to $699 to $1,079, depending on which of the 12th gen Intel chips you want. Framework also released a new 2.5 gigabit Ethernet expansion card as well. Samsung mobile president TM Rowe uh, said that the overall smartphone industry shipped almost 10 million foldable phones in 2021. That's up 300% from 2020. For context, Samsung shipped 272 million smartphones in 2021. Ross Young of Display Supply Chain Consultants reports that Samsung held an 87.8% market share for foldables in 2021. A few tech updates out of China today. Uh, tech Insights reports that SMIC has been shipping a 7 nanometer process node chip uh, since July 2021. Tech Insights reversion engineered the chip and said the initial images suggest it's a close copy of TSMC's 7 nanometer nanometer process technology. Meanwhile, the Cyberspace Administration of China fined DD Global, finally, they've been, this has been coming for a while, uh, more than 8 billion yuan, about $1.2 billion US. This is over its management of personal data. Bloomberg sources say the company does not know when it can relaunch its mobile apps domestically, which were taken off app stores in July 2021. And Baidu announced a new autonomous vehicle with a detachable steering wheel intended for its robo-taxi service in China next year. Baidu says the car will have level four autonomous capability, meaning no need for human intervention in specific areas. It can't drive everywhere autonomously, but in a place that it's allowed to, you won't need to have the person paying attention. Ford announced it will have enough battery supplies to put 600,000 EVs on the market per year by the end of 2023. Ford extended an agreement with the world's largest battery pack supplier, China's contemporary Amprex Technology. It will also buy batteries from LG Energy Solutions and increase its orders from SK On. Ford also made a deal for raw materials, getting lithium from Nevada's Rhyolite Ridge Mine. That'll be helpful in making lithium ion phosphate, or LFP batteries, which Ford will add to the mix alongside the more traditional nickel cobalt mag magnanese batteries it and most e -make EV makers currently rely on. Yeah, so Ford getting in the battery game real big like. All right, let's talk about Amazon buying your doctor. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with One Medical or you didn't hear about it today, a bit of a darling of Silicon Valley. It's a primary medical care provider in the U.S. that provides all of your health care needs in one place, although you need to have insurance before you use One Medical. It's not actually an insurance company. It includes a range of telemedicine services as well, centralizing services like lab work, some specialists. 
promoting digital and virtual interactions more. One Medical promises 24-7 telehealth and same or next day appointments guaranteed. So if you're a person who waits several weeks to see your doctor, you know, it, 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 it can be very attractive. They offer a direct consumer product that you pay for on top of your health insurance, but also offer the service through companies for more than uh, 8,500 organizations. So you can think of it kind of like <laughs> a Whole Foods for healthcare. It might pay a little more, but you might like it better. Modern forward thinking and also pricier. Yeah, and uh, that Whole Foods is an apt comparison since Amazon is buying one medical just like they bought Whole Foods. Uh, other than paying $18 a share and valuing the company at $3.9 billion, though, Amazon hasn't said much about its plans for one medical, just that it loves them and they love us and we can't wait to work together. Uh, Amazon has been developing a healthcare strategy over the past few years. Since 2018, it has run an online pharmacy thanks to its acquisition of PillPack. And in 2021, it expanded its Amazon Care telehealth service across the U.S. Uh, Amazon Care is virtual and only offered through employers, but it's roughly comparable to One Medical other than that. Uh, think of it as the Amazon Fresh to One Medical's Whole Foods, perhaps. Uh, Amazon might roll One Medical and Amazon Care into one service. It might keep them separate. Uh, we do know that One Medical CEO Amr Don Rubin said he will continue to run One Medical after the close of the deal. Uh, if you're interested in how One Medical is doing, the company lost $90.9 .9 million on revenue of $254.1 million in its Q1. But <laughs> Amazon's kind of used to running services at a loss or low profit margin until they reach scale. Of course, the deal will need regulatory sign-off and approval from shareholders uh, in order for it to go through. That regulatory part is the part that, you know, I, I think I've seen a lot of FUD on the internet about this. Um, and, you know, a lot of people saying this is the worst. Now Amazon's going to be you know, know all of my health data and, you know, will try to sell me things based on what's wrong with me, et cetera, et cetera. And there is, you know, you can, you know, lend some credence to that kind of thinking. I'm not sure what data one medical has from the insurance company partners it works with. Maybe all of it, maybe partially some of the data. Uh, maybe there will be some sort of, you know, statement from Amazon explaining exactly why Amazon doesn't have access to this data because One Medical is still going to be run independently. A lot of questions to be answered yet. Well, and, and don't forget that, yes, Amazon will have access because Amazon owns One Medical, but Amazon Retail will not have access to anything that HIPAA prevents them from accessing, unless you believe Amazon's just going to break the rules, which maybe you believe. Uh, but that would be a serious problem for a company that wants to expand its healthcare business to be caught violating HIPAA out of the gate. So I would not expect there to be sharing of data between Amazon Retail and One Medical. I would be more concerned with the fact that One Medical has suffered a, a data breach in the past and what is Amazon going to be doing to make sure that the information that they do have stays secure and stays private intentionally? Uh, you're up there in Amazon country, Joel, and, and you're a human being who I assume, <laughs> may, you know, occasionally needs medical care. How, how do you feel about this? It's really interesting to think about because like it's uh, like Sarah said, though, it's it's for available for employers only, if I remember right. And uh, before this, before I was a content creator, I worked for Adobe. And so I remember having health care. But it, so then would would employees, rather than offering health insurance, offer services through One Medical? So then, if that's the case, then how I, I'm really curious how it works out because then, I mean, people like to travel, and typically, mm -hmm. if you have health insurance coverage, that covers you somewhere else. But if your health is or your health services are provided by a company that is partnering with your employer in order to make those services possible, then do you have that that coverage that is that transports with you to other places? Uh, but but what really got me curious though, because Amazon likes to acquire companies, as we all know, are we are we finding ourselves more towards the future that's depicted in Wally? -E? Is Amazon the the by and large now at this point? Yeah. I I, I think it's it, it People generally don't conflate 
AWS and Amazon uh, because we're used to that. And uh, and and so when these stories come out, it's it's easy to to immediately go there to go to be like, oh, it's going to all be one service. I'll be I'll be shopping for almonds on Amazon.com, and it'll it'll ask me if I, you know I want to get a cholesterol test. Uh, I'm not saying that's <laughs> impossible, but I imagine that what Amazon wants to do with One Medical is is cr- create easy healthcare in a separate way, branded separately, like AWS is branded separately now, uh, that that will be sort of a an HMO that you can get uh, easily. Uh, it, it, and, and I should run to, to clarify a few things. One medical is available directly. It, you don't have to go through an employer to get it. They go through employers, but you don't have to. Amazon Care, which is the existing Amazon thing that's all virtual, does only go uh, through employer health insurance. But in both cases, you, they are neither one of them health insurance. You have to have health insurance to pay for everything. These are just making it easier, making it nicer, giving you a nicer lobby, putting the the lab somewhere, giving you- It's like you know, the advanced package on a car. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like you already have the car, but if you want it to be kind of cooler, maybe- Who was it in our Discord extra? that described it as TSA pre for medical? Because they give you same day that was That was also me. Oh, there you yeah, go. Yeah, that was you good. Have to buy I'm just trying, trying to find lots of analogies this morning because I actually used to think one medical was health insurance. I know a fair amount of people who have it, and I thought, oh, it's for people who can afford it. It, which is still true because it's a premium on top of your health insurance. But uh, but yeah, it, it works differently than I think, you know, a lot of people say Amazon bought a health insurance company. Yeah, eh, no, not really. Did. Not really. Yeah. And, and it's two hundred dollars a year, which is not nothing. But it's it's basically like saying I want to get a, a primary care physician uh, and get a little extra. So I'll pay a, yeah. I'll pay a little extra on top of my health insurance for my doctor. Right. Well, at that point, we're talking the price of a couple lattes a month then for mm-hmm. that, that premium experience. Yeah. Which, if you're not drinking, is better for your health, unless they That's, were non fat I, I suppose. Guess. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, <laughs> let's talk spam. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, who likes spam here? Nobody. <laughs> Rhetorical question. For years, the promise of getting rid of email spam uh, has never really worked. Spam has persisted. It's a vile weed because it's pretty free to send spam, but it costs a lot to stop it. Many folks have proposed ideas to shift the cost onto the sender somehow. You know, why does the recipient have to suffer without punishing legitimate senders in the process? So here's the latest. Protocol has a report on a company called Gated that fights email spam by making spammers donate to charity. You might say, how in the heck would that work? Statista estimates that spam made up 45% of all email traffic as of December. It's a huge problem. Gated refers to itself as noise-canceling headphones for email. Tom, how does this work? So Gated analyzes when you set it up who you've emailed in the past and then builds an allow list. And it's just going to let those through. Uh, Anybody not on that list, however, will get an auto reply that reads, I don't recognize your email address. So you'll need to take one simple step in order for your message to reach me. And then it will offer a link to donate money to a charity that you choose or the option of verifying yourself. And I'm actually unclear what the verifying yourself part does. I think it maybe just alerts you on the other end that this person is saying uh, they're a, a person you know. You, the user, choose the charity from a list and you also set the price that they have to donate. Could be a buck, could be 10 bucks. Depends on how much you want to keep people out of your inbox. If the sender pays the money to the charity... Uh, their email goes to your inbox rather than to a special gated folder. 70% of that money goes to the charity. 15% just gets eaten up by processing fees. That's normal. And then gated keeps 15% of that as its way of making money. So you don't pay anything to run gated. They make their money off the people who pay to get into your inbox. If the sender doesn't donate, the email doesn't go into a spam folder. It goes into a gated folder that you can go and look through from time to time and see, oh, that person shouldn't have been in there, just like you would with a spam folder. But theoretically, it's going to have less spam because I think this happens after normal spam filters have already worked. Uh, As you email people with gated uh, on, it will automatically update your allow list to include those new people. And you can also go in and manually update it yourself. Uh, Protocol also notes that gated CEO Andy Mawat got the idea after he set up an auto reply back in the day asking senders to send 10 cents to his Venmo if they wanted him to read their email. 
He promised to donate to the Wounded Warrior Project, and not only did many people donate, but some exceeded the request and donated $20 or even more. Yeah, because he was a CEO of a company that wanted to get into his inbox, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of like this idea. I know it's not going to work for everybody. As a, as a journalist, not not that I do journalism from day to day, but you know, having been trained in journalism, journalists are not going to want to appear to be pay to play. Even if it's going to charity, they're not going to want somebody to feel like, oh, I have to pay to get this journalist to pay attention to me. That 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 is a conflict of interest. But for a lot of people, I think they'll look at this and say, great. Yeah, I love this. Just keep people away from me. Joel, would you do this? I... <sighs> I have an issue with this. Um, I'm not, I, believe me, I love charity. And if I, for some reason, if I ran gated, I'd be like, okay, send me a buck and I'll give it to Seattle Children's Hospital up here. That's easy, right? But but what I'm wondering is typically spam, like I will get hundreds of spam messages a day. And typically they come from mailboxes that don't exist or spoofed email addresses or whatever. And so if gated is taking care of this and you get a spam message, or let's say I get a hundred spam messages and gated intercepts that, and then sends a reply to a hundred spam messages saying you have to donate a dollar. Aren't we at that point generating more email traffic? Yes. I don't know if it's significant enough to make a difference yet, but that is an interesting thought experiment of like, at what scale, <laughs> at what adoption level does gated, you know, I mean, it's still just email, which is very low bit rate on, on current bandwidth, but, but yeah, it's not impossible that it, that it might cause server issues, but theoretically, wouldn't it cause the worst server issues on spam servers? It could, or whoever they've spoofed to route through. Yeah, you know, that's true. Because they will, route, will route through those. Mm. But uh, but beyond that, so I I, I kind of reserve judgment because I would want to talk to the people that actually want to utilize this service. Like I said, I get hundreds of spam messages, and I use Google Mail, but it catches nine out of ten, ninety out of a hundred. It's really pretty good. It does have some false positives as well, but just like with gated, I mean, you, you would have to scroll through that anyway. And so I'm really curious who's the target here. Who would, who would want this? Who has that specific spam problem in their email that normal spam filters aren't able to correct for? And I'd love to, I'd love to hear their thoughts and see I, how I they're using it. If, from the pitch, it sounds like they're talking about in uh, like people in business, you know, Bob business, quote unquote, uh, <laughs> where, cause again, I haven't confirmed this, but, the, but I get the sense that your spam filter still works and that takes out 90% of the stuff and gated never even touches that. It's the, it's the stuff we used to call bacon, the stuff that's like, well, it's not exactly spam, but it's unsolicited and maybe it's a press release or somebody cold calling you that that's the stuff that it mm -hmm. filters out to, okay. because there's always that like 10% of spam that doesn't get spam filtered and you're still mm -hmm. like, yeah, okay, this stuff is just filling up my inbox. I feel like that's the stuff gated is focused on. And some people get a lot more of that than others. I think well, and a, Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Go, no, please. You, you're our guest. Well, I was just thinking, I, I think there's value there. And I think for me personally, I would, I just, I want to know more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I tried to sign up so that I could figure out a little more how it worked directly. Uh, but I think this protocol article uh, has got them swamped uh, because I could not complete the sign up. Uh, People process. hate it, spam. It would just People want up. answers. So, yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's good news for Gated. Uh, hey, folks, if you've been enjoying our guests this week, please spread the word. Uh, we, we've been having amazing people like Joel on all week long. Uh, so if you could get out there and, and share a link to the episode uh, from DTNS Show on Twitter, DTNS Picks on Instagram, uh, send it to your friends and family uh, by email if they don't have Gated and you won't get stopped. Let them know uh, they need to be listening to Daily Tech News Show. Well, 3D printing is pretty great. You can 3D print tools for various projects. You can print art sculptures. You could even print something simple to replace a broken part around your house. But for a lot of people, unless you're already part of a DIY or maker community, getting started with 3D printing can be a little intimidating. People often think, well, I'm not skilled enough to participate. Having gone through the 3D printing area at CES over the years, I'm definitely in that camp. Thankfully, Joel... You have lots of experience in this area. So if somebody wants to get started in 3D printing, you know, what do they need? Do they need a certain kind of computer setup? You know, what's what's kind of the basis of this? Well, for computer setup, um, a lot of times used to be you needed a somewhat powerful system to run the 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 the. the, the 
the programs that would do CAD based engineering uh, way back in the day. Now, though, what's really great, you have things that are web based. And so Chromebooks, um, even like the, the like the Chromebooks that schools provide to students, uh, home desktop machines, laptops, iPads, iPhones, Android devices, all of those are now uh, able to run the applications that allow you to create and mold and make all sorts of really cool 3D models. So, all right, you mentioned CAD software. A lot of people go, mm, yeah, no, I didn't take, you know, <laughs> that architectural drawing in, in college. So is, does that help to have a basic understanding of that? Or is this just plug and play like it didn't used to be? It it helps to always have a, uh, a more in-depth understanding of the things that you're using. Uh, uh, you don't have to know the history of hammers to use a hammer, but it's it, if you're going to be building a house, there's different types of fasteners that that hammer can hit in mm -hmm. order to secure wood and metal beams together. Um, I don't think uh, I, I, CAD. It used to be that that daunting sort of thing that a lot of people would 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 uh, do and just kind of hover over keyboard for hours. I mean, there's still people that do that, but if you can imagine drawing a line in two directions and then connecting them. And then taking that square circle or oval shape that you've made and think about extruding it into 3D space, that's CAD at that point. You've made 3D geometry. And so being able to not just make it to lower the bar for access to these tools, but to make it so that these tools run on the devices that are ubiquitous within, within the population, then you have the barrier to entry is lower and you have a lot more people learning about the concepts of, of making these 3D geometries that might have been too complex before. All right. So let's say you're, you say, OK, I thought this is going to be harder. I'm ready to jump in. Uh, does it matter what the project is that you want to achieve? Is that going to determine the model or type of 3D printer that you end up buying or are they generally Kind of like an inkjet printer where, you know, you pick you pick the brand you like and you buy some ink. Let's say you're starting out and you've got nothing. You're like, you know what? I, I've seen Joel. I've seen others talk about 3D printing. I'm interested. How do I get started? I, it's, a, it's a great way to think about it because a lot of times uh, necessity drives the need. There's a, there's a lot of people that get started with 3D printing because... Um, Perhaps they're doing D and D miniatures, or they have uh, role playing games where they have miniatures. And they want to be able to make those in real life, or there are projects around the house that that need the advantages that three D printing has: jigs and fixtures, and uh, little things to kind of help with day to day life. Um, once once you've identified, and I mean, and also a, another need is just because it's really cool. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> it's it's just really cool. So if you if you can't define your need, then being able to pick out a machine and a material to use really is just part of the next process. It's it's more simple to get into additive manufacturing, 3D printing now than it ever has been before. So I mentioned, you know, likening this to buying ink for, for an inkjet printer. Uh, filament is the material that 3D mm -hmm. printers use, uh, but they're not all the same, right? How do you know what kind of filament you need? Is it again, you know, if, you, if you're looking at the instructions for a project, it'll tell you, or you, you just kind of play around and see what works best. You can actually have, uh, we have what's called a, a, a BOM or a bill of materials. And a lot of times it'll list out models that need to be printed in order to create the project. And it'll tell you not just the materials to use, but the settings for the printer to make it the best. Um, I think getting getting into this, you start with a really simple, so a, a really simple material for 3D printing is called PLA. It's uh, corn based and it, it melts at one of the lower temperatures. Uh, it comes in lots of pretty colors uh, and it's just, uh, it's, it's one of the easiest materials to print with. Um, but I would imagine if you if you had a specific use in mind, then you would go researching the right material for the job because all mm -hmm. sorts of materials have different temperatures that they melt at. They have different uh, mechanical properties as far as stretching or rigidity or being able to uh, withstand certain limits. Um, it's it's one of those things, and I, and I liken it to to being able to utilize a tool for something else. If you're going to build something, you're going to do some research into the right materials of how you're going to build it. It's it's exactly the same with the filaments for 3D printing. If you're just doing some decorative things, 
there's a good chance that PLA is going to work for you. Uh, if it's going to exist outside and it's really sunny where you're at, there's a filament called ASA, which has some UV resistance. Um, if it has to withstand really high temperatures, perhaps you go with something called ABS. It's the same material that Lego is made from. <laughs> uh, perhaps you have to think about a material with... Um, that has to replace a metal part in an industry. Well, you can look at materials like uh, Peak, PEC, or Ultim, and those materials are in, on the industrial side, but those can actually be, um, the geometries that you can print with these materials can actually sometimes replace uh, metals. Hmm. Wow. So, all right, this is, let's say, you know, I'm thinking of projects around my house. I actually have a towel rack that broke recently. It's made of wood. It's, it was a stupid towel rack to begin with, but, it, you know, it's, it's, I don't even know how to replace this thing. Is that too ambitious for a first project? Do people do things like print towel racks or should I, should I start with something that's just like make something that looks like a Lego? Sarah, this is perfect. This is absolutely, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not kidding. This is perfect because you have a, a use in mind. A towel rack, essentially, if you think about it, you're like, okay, take it apart into its uh, into its components. You've got um, a, a rack has a, a holder over here and a holder over here, and there's a bar in the middle. And most likely then, if you're going to use 3D printing, that bar in the middle, probably not something that needs to be 3D printed because you can get a wooden dowel or a metal rack or metal uh, metal rod, or it maybe maybe the towel rack, maybe the sides were... Um, wood and the, this wasn't or something, I don't know, being able to have something with a lot of structural uh, to be structural rigidity over that length and it's a towel, you could you could find a way like a, like, a, like a wooden dowel or something. But the things that hold it on the end, that's perfect for 3D printing because in your head, you know it's there and you kind of will probably have a general idea of what you want. And if you could on paper, you could start to sketch some things just to kind of how it would look. And then you go to a 3D program such as uh, Tinkercad, which is web-based, and it's essentially shape math. You can you can take a, a cube and add a sphere to it and then subtract that sphere from the cube, and you're left with this 3D geometry. So now Ooh. using, using uh, that sort of thinking, you can go build yourself the towel rack ends, and then you can print them out, and then you can try it out. And if it doesn't work or if it doesn't look exactly like what you're thinking, the great part about this 3D printing is you've probably only used pennies worth of material and you can go through in Tinkercad and adjust your design little bits here and there and then print it out again and try it again. That's amazing. Well, before before we wrap up um, this uh, very interesting conversation that has me thinking all sorts of stuff, like where's my 3D printer going to go in the studio? Uh, explain something called 87 Days of 3D Printing with Neil Patrick Harris. Ah, uh, that was fun. So um, a couple of years ago, Neil tweeted out that he wanted to get back into 3D printing and he asked for people's advice and tagged a few manufacturers and hundreds of people replied saying, you should just talk to Joel. And at the time, uh, my producer knew someone who knew someone who knew his assistant. And so taking that information and sending it up the chain saying, hey, maybe we should work together. A lot of people are suggesting this. Um, it didn't go anywhere at the time. It was about a year later. And then all of a sudden we got contacted because um, that person I think left and there was a new person, but through my producer said, hey, let's get started with this. And we worked out a live stream. So Neil and I streamed live on YouTube for about two hours where he got a certain 3D printer and he set it up and he did his first print. It went really well, he was really excited. And so we started thinking about a project that we could do. And I had these machines that could print really long parts and so the project was to create these, these old frames. Like if you imagine old picture frames found in an attic that are gold and dusty and worn. Yeah. Uh, so we, I had some friends who are really good at design, design this frame. And then I fired off a bunch of 3D printers that I had in my studio for just weeks on end, 3D printing all the parts. And then we, <laughs> I shipped it all via UPS to Neil next day. Uh, I actually never mentioned this, but um, it was $1,800 to ship all of these parts to <laughs> Neil on the other side of the States. Because I'm here in Seattle. I shipped them out to New York. Uh -huh. And I, sh I I went to UPS at 4 p.m. They were on his doorstop the next day at wow. 9 a.m. It was crazy. Wow. But he and his husband and his kids got the parts, put them all together, painted them up. 
And then I and my team flew out there to kind of do some of the final work and show them off. And it was, it was a bunch of fun. It was an amazing experience. Absolutely amazing. Well, Joel, this uh, so much great information that you've given us. And for anybody who's taking notes at home, we will have a lot of links um, that are helpful for everything that Joel mentioned in our show notes. But but we really appreciate you being on the show. So much fun. Uh, this again, fun. thank you. Such good info. Let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you do so they don't miss another cool project. Sure. If you go to YouTube and look up 3D Printing Nerd, that's me. You can actually go to YouTube.com forward slash 3D Printing Nerd. That'll get you right where you need to go. Uh, also, I'm very active on Twitter. I'm at Joel Telling. Pretty easy. Um, if you just go look up either Joel Telling or 3D Printing Nerd on most social media networks, you'll find me. And, right. I'd love to, and I'd love to hear from you. Great. Well, thank you so much again for being with us, Joel. Thank you. Also, thanks to our brand new bosses. We got two of them today. Alexander and Benjamin just started backing us on Patreon. We thank you both. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Benjamin. You could be the Alexander and Benjamin of tomorrow, folks. Just go to patreon.com slash DTNS. <laughs> <laughs> There's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. We start it right after DTNS wraps up. Available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Just a reminder, if you've got thoughts, you got questions, you can email us feedback at Daily Tech News Show. Also a reminder, we're live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Justin Roby to talk about building a PC. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>